Thank you for joining us today for the Nursing Grand Round Program. My name is Victoria Lanty and I'm the Education Program Manager for Michigan Center for Rural Health and will be helping facilitate today's program. This program is pro jointly provided by the Michigan Center for Rural Health in cooperation with the Michigan State University College of Nursing. The program is, provided, is providing nursing continuing education. However, if there are other health professions listening on the lines, you can receive a certificate of participation. Please remember to keep your mic muted until the Q&A component at the end of the program. Please remember to mute your mic after you have asked your question so the signal is clear and we can have questions answered by our presenter. Handouts are located on our website at www.mcrh.msu.edu. Click on the education link across the top and scroll down till you get find the May 11th date. There you will find attendance forms, um, the evaluation link, and today's presentation. Attendance forms need to be filled out and by hand and then sent back into our office. Don't forget you are required to um, fill out your attendance form and email it back to our office. Email it, fax, or mail it back to our office and then complete the online evaluation. Certificates will not be sent out unless both the evaluation and attendance form have been completed. We are asking you complete these forms and return them to our office within two weeks or by May 25th. The certificates will be emailed out and usually take six to eight weeks to receive. Um, the, plan, the speaker and planning committee didn't um, indicate that there are no conflict of interest for this program and no commercial support has been provided. At this time, I am pleased to present our speaker, Kathy Forrest, who will be speaking on human trafficking, a call to action for nurses. Go ahead. Good afternoon, all of you, and I want to wish each of you a happy Nurses Week. Hopefully you've had some opportunity in your facility uh, to celebrate all that this week um, has to offer for you both professionally and personally. We usually only have one week designed or set aside for this, so hopefully you've been able to celebrate. Um, as Victoria said, my name is Kathy Forrest. I'm a faculty in the College of Nursing here at Michigan State University. I teach undergraduate students, and I also am responsible for all of the continuing education programs uh, that are produced through the College of Nursing uh, for nurses at the university. Today's topic, Human Trafficking, a Call for Action for Nurses, is one that, as you know, is very popular. There are many, many uh, people on the line that want to hear this content, not that it's an interesting content area, but because, as you know, it's one of the licensure requirements for training um, for the state of Michigan and across the nation. First, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Katie Kessler. She and I have been working on this content for over a year um, in anticipation of the Board of Nursing rules that would include training. So I, I want to acknowledge the work that Katie has done in this regard. As Victoria said, there's no commercial interest um, to disclose for the presentation, no financial support from a commercial entity, and the criteria to, to obtain your continuing nursing education is to verify your attendance and also to complete your evaluation. Human trafficking is a global problem and it's prevalent in the entire United States and internationally. This presentation is developed for nurses and other healthcare providers to provide an overview of the problem, as well as strategies for healthcare providers to use in their clinical practice. The hope is to educate, raise awareness, and provide better care for victims of human trafficking that might come before you in your healthcare settings. The outcome for today's presentation is that you will acquire knowledge in recognition assessment and follow-up of human trafficking victims in practice, and you will adhere to the Michigan Board of Nursing requirements for relicensure. So let's get started with the recognition assessment and follow-up of human trafficking. As many of you may know, beginning in January 2018 in the renewal cycle that begins in January of this year, and all new uh, renewal cycles thereafter, there is a requirement for training for identifying victims of human trafficking, and that's for licensed individuals and those seeking licensure. 
The training standards are found in the Administrative Rules 338-10105, and I do have that linked at the bottom of this page, and also the information from Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs regarding this matter. They have a great um, frequently asked questions area um, for your review. The, um, the training standards are outlined in uh, the Board of Nursing and the Administrative Rule. Number one, understanding types and venues of human traffic in this state and the United States. Number two, identifying victims of human trafficking in healthcare settings, identifying warning signs of human trafficking in healthcare settings for adults and minors. And number four, identifying resources for reporting suspected victims of human trafficking. The training also has um, a number of ways that it can be offered and acceptable modalities of training. Today's um, training in this modality certainly satisfies that requirement. And also need you to know that the training does not include um, nursing, the training requirement rather, does not include nursing continuing education. You don't have to go to a training that includes continuing nursing education, but this, uh, this offering today does. And so even though it's not required for the training requirement, today's continuing education will, will um, count against your 25 contact hours in two years. So um, that, that I think is a good thing. So let's begin by starting uh, to talk about the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. It was enacted in the year 2000, and it was the first federal law to address trafficking in persons in a very comprehensive way. It defines human trafficking as modern-day slavery and also as a crime under federal and international law and in every state of the United States. There is a myth that adults and children who've been coerced into prostitution in the United States are considered criminals. This is not the case. They are not criminals. In fact, adults and children coerced into prostitution are victims of human trafficking. Uh-oh. we got to stop. Sorry, we lost connection. We're going to start again. Okay. And then... The oh. button, yeah. oh, no. Welcome to the Michigan Center for Rural Health Grand Round Series. That's never happened before. <laughs> oh, well, it happened today. I don't think I'll show the video because I think we'll be squeezed for time. Are we back? Lisa, Sharon, hello, sites. We can hear you. Okay, go ahead. Excellent. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That um, was really out of our control. Um, I'm on slide eight, if some of you um, got disconnected. Um, so I'm talking about the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. This law allows traffickers of minors to be prosecuted, and also healthcare providers have a mandatory reporting requirement for minors who are suspected to be trafficked, and we will be talking more in detail about that requirement in subsequent slides. So here's the definition of human trafficking. Um, there are two types of human trafficking, one being sex trafficking and other labor trafficking. The definitions on the slides are those that are most commonly used to describe human trafficking, and they're also used by law enforcement in order to prosecute perpetrators. So for sex trafficking, the, the definition is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, and a big or or in which the person induced to perform this, uh, such an act has not attained 18 years of age. So it do not need to Hey, there's a site that has their mic unmuted. Can we have make sure that everybody has their mics muted with star six? Thank you. 
The other type of trafficking is labor trafficking. The recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And again, these are the definitions for the two types of trafficking, both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And again, we'll be talking more about individuals that are under the age of 18 in subsequent slides. The American Nurses Association has developed a position statement on human trafficking and states that nurses are in a perfect position to intervene and advocate for these, these victims when they encounter them in healthcare settings. All demographics are at risk for being victimized, and vulnerability is really a unifying characteristic among these individuals. This is a very short video from the Polaris Project from the National Human Trafficking uh, Resource Center. I won't take the time to show it to you now since we got started a little late and had some interruption. So please go on to the on to this. Um, PowerPoint and access this video. There's another video later on in the presentation, but I won't take the time to, to show it now. So the next slide is the AMP model. According to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, human trafficking occurs when the trafficker takes on any one of enumerated actions. So in the box under actions, they can induce, recruit, harbor, transport, provide, or obtain, and then employs the means of force, fraud, and coercion, the middle box of means, for the purpose of compelling the victim to provide commercial sex acts or labor or services. At a minimum, one element from each column must be present to establish the potential situation for human trafficking. Situations of minors engaging in commercial sex are human trafficking despite the presence of force, fraud, or coercion, as I've already mentioned. The presence of force, fraud, or coercion indicates that the victim has not consented of his or her own free will. Every year, human traffickers generate billions of dollars in profits by victimizing millions of people in the United States and around the world. Traffickers are ex estimated to exploit 20.9 million victims with an estimated of 2 million victims in North America. Despite the growing awareness of this crime, human trafficking continues to go underreported due to its covert nature, the misconceptions about its definition, and a lack of awareness about its indicators. The National Human Trafficking Resource Center states that human trafficking is a market-driven criminal industry, and it's based on the principles of supply and demand, like drugs or arms trafficking. Many factors make children and adults very vulnerable to human trafficking. Human trafficking does not exist solely because many people are vulnerable to exploitation. Instead, human trafficking is fueled by a demand for cheap labor, services, or for commercial sex. Human traffickers are those who employ force, fraud, or coercion to victimize others in their desire to profit from the existing demand. To ultimately solve the problem of human trafficking, it is essential to address these demand-driven factors, as well as to alter the overall market incentives of high profit and low risk. Let's talk first about low risk. Human traffickers perceive that there's very little risk or deterrence that would affect their criminal operations. With investigations while they're ongoing, um, prosecutions and penalties have increased during recent years. Many traffickers still believe that the high profit margin is worth the risk. Factors that add to low risk include lack of government and law enforcement training, low community awareness, ineffective or unused laws, lack of law enforcement investigation, scarce resources for victim recovery service, services, and also social blaming of victims. High profits, let's talk about high profits for a bit. When individuals are willing to buy commercial sex, they create a market and make it profitable for traffickers to sexually exploit children and adults. 
And then when consumers are willing to buy the goods and services from industries that rely on forced labor, they create a profit incentive for labor traffickers to maximize revenue with minimal production costs. A major reason for this initiative is that human trafficking continue to flourish in environments where traffickers can reap substantial monetary gains with relatively low risk of getting caught or losing their profits. We, as healthcare professionals, need to change this dynamic. Let's talk a little bit about the statistics around human trafficking. The National Human Trafficking Hotline um, is collecting data all the while they are, they are accepting calls from traffickers. Reports of human trafficking in the United States has increased 35% over that of 2015. More survivors are reaching out for help and they're looking for internet sources to do that. And they're also looking for help from healthcare professionals where they often might go for assistance. Labor trafficking has, has been reported in 2016 to be increased by 47%, but we know that it is still widely underreported. Here is a map of the United States, and it sickens me to see the red um, that shows up in the state of Michigan. Notice specifically South east and southwest Michigan, also the, um, the, the increased areas across the borders into Canada, both in the UP and also in the, the Canadian border uh, to, to Windsor. And also notice the, where you might see the I-80, I-90 um, corridor to the east and, and up the east coast. It's very easy for individuals in the state of Michigan to be trafficked. And it's very prevalent in the state of Michigan, as you can see. Some more statistics about Michigan. There's estimated to be over 20 million victims of human trafficking across the world. Actual numbers are really hard to determine because in many ways it's an underground industry. Michigan is popular for human trafficking because more children are trafficked in uh, m m many more children uh, are trafficked in Michigan because of a number of things. The fact that we're a border state, the fact that we um, have access to other countries through our borders, and that we're surrounded on three sides by water, and our economy is manufacturing, agriculture, and very tourism-based. Michigan also is popular for human trafficking because of our licensed foster care homes. We have over 900 licensed foster care homes on farms, but estimates are that there are 1,500 unlicensed homes with high potential for trafficking of children specifically. Only about 25% of law enforcement officers and about 15% of healthcare professionals in the year of 2016 had been trained in human trafficking. Thus, the, uh, the requirement by the Michigan Board of Nursing and also this presentation to help build a awareness around this topic. Here are some more um, statistics that are related to Michigan regarding human trafficking from the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. As mentioned earlier, Michigan is one of the highest states for trafficking, and as of December 31, 2016, there had been 843 calls and 246 reported cases of trafficking, and this most likely is just the tip of the iceberg. So the number of calls that go unreported um, are certainly not captured. More statistics for the state of Michigan, the types of trafficking and the top venues for sex trafficking in the state of Michigan. The two most common types of trafficking, as I mentioned, are um, sex and labor, with sex far outpacing labor trafficking. Sex trafficking can and does take place in many settings. Some are illegal, but many are fronted by legitimate businesses. The girls and women who are forced to be sex slaves by their traffickers are, are not hidden from view. To say that this is a lucrative business is an understatement. It's estimated that the profits from sex trafficking and domestic servitude and labor trafficking is billions and billions of dollars. And the average age of girls for slavery is between... Sorry, we lost connection. This is insane. I know.
I'm going to text. Welcome to the Michigan Center for up. Rural Health's Grand Round Series. I'm going to ask them. Why Was somebody you? trying to call? Maybe it's my phone. Oh, be back. Okay, are we back? We're on slide 18. The average age of girls forced into sexual slavery is between 12 and 14 years of age, a really horrifying fact. Sex trafficking incidents can increase around large venue events, such as the Detroit Auto Show and other similar events that draw large crowds of people, um, mostly men, unfortunately. A few more statistics for the state of Michigan from 2016. Labor trafficking can occur in many settings, and these people are often in plain sight, working in agriculture, restaurants, private homes, and even in health care. Here, too, most victims of labor trafficking are female, but boys and young men are also victims. Who were the reporters of cases of human trafficking? Unfortunately, this slide helps to illustrate how uninformed healthcare professionals are on the topic of human trafficking and reporting. You can see of all the individuals who reported cases on this slide, the least, the, the least reporting were those of medical professionals. So we all need to do a better job of reporting cases of suspected trafficked victims. And who are the traffickers? As this slide shows, there isn't one type of person who's a trafficker, which makes it really hard to identify them. Traffickers can be strangers, but they can also be people the victim knows, friends, or even worse, family members. They're most often male, but women traffickers are not uncommon. Some, of, some are foreign nationals, but United States citizens are part of this activity too and they might work independently. Say a couple might traffic a housekeeper or a nanny for their own purposes for childcare, or they may be part of a network of traffickers who are engaged in sex or labor trafficking and other criminal activities. How do traffickers gain control and power over their victims? They use a variety of tactics. Physical violence is common, beatings, forced drug use, Heroin is often used to um, really secure bondage of these victims. Starvation is also used, sleep deprivation, and strangulation. Sexual violence is abhorrent and it's also very common. Rape is used to um, have power over victims. Gang, gang rape, rape or pornography and prostitution. Intimidation through um, different means, threatening someone with a weapon, making a victim watch other people being beaten. Emotional violence is almost always present. Individuals who are trafficked are isolated, they're humiliated, they're threatened by, of deportation. They can have alternating violence with kindness to, to keep the, um, the folks hooked in, keep those trafficked individuals hooked in. Sometimes the trafficker threatens that family members will be harmed if the victim doesn't comply, and they can use blackmail or extortion as well. And often the trafficker takes their assets from the victim. They take their papers, their passport, their money, anything that would identify them um, so that um, police or other law enforcement um, can't make charges against them because they can't identify who they are. Such horrific treatment ultimately causes a great deal of long-lasting physical and mental anguish for the victim. Human trafficking is happening right under our noses. This slide gives you some um, links to some of the most, some recent cases, most of them are from 2016. Um, as many of you know, even if you're not from the, the uh, Lansing area, our own Ingham County prosecutor, Stuart Dunnings, was arrested and is now in jail for human trafficking. And that went on for years without being detected. So it is right under our noses. Now let's talk about risk factors. Um, this is, uh, as many of you may know, or some of you may know, this is really the ecological model. Um, 
identifying risk factors for, for individuals. The National Academies Press has, re, re, has produced this report on human trafficking, and this figure illustrates the risks for trafficking. They range from individual factors all the way over to the right to, social, to societal risk factors all the way over to the left. Under the individual factors, they are such as the history of child abuse or neglect, homelessness, being in a foster care situation or in a criminal justice system, as we've talked a little bit about already. LGBT individuals are at a higher risk than other groups. Relationship factors such as family conflict or dysfunction can also place people at risk. Involvement in gangs, poor schools, unsafe neighborhoods, or a lack of opportunity um, are also community factors. And then there are societal factors. The sexualization of children, objectification of women, and just lack of awareness about the problem. Also, being a vulnerable person is a uniting characteristic in this problem of human trafficking. Now we're going to talk about a few myths and misconceptions. The first bullet on the slide talks about trafficked persons can only be foreign nationals and are immigrants from other countries. This is not true. The federal definition includes both U.S. citizens and foreign nationals, and both of these are protected under the federal trafficking statutes. The second bullet, human trafficking is essentially a crime that must involve some sort of travel or transportation or movement across state or national borders. Trafficking doesn't require transportation. It's not part of that as a, as a required element. The third bullet, human trafficking is another term for human smuggling. That also is not true. Human trafficking is a crime against a person. Smuggling is a, is a crime against a country's border. They're both federal crimes in the United States, but they are different. There must be elements of physical restraint, physical force, or physical bondage when identifying a human trafficking situation. That also is not true. Trafficking doesn't require physical restraint, but it often is part of the way traffickers keep individuals in bondage. These um, were added to the Victim Trafficking Protection Act in 2000, so they are all part of, of that act. More myths and misconceptions. Victims of human trafficking will immediately ask for help or assistance and will help identify as a victim of a crime. Victims often don't immediately seek help or self-identify as a victim of a crime for many, many reasons. They lack trust. They have all the self-blame. They have specific instructions by their traffickers as how to respond to questions from law enforcement or social service entities. They can't, they, they risk their lives by speaking up. The second bullet, human trafficking victims always come from a situation of poverty or from small rural villages. Poverty alone is not a single causal factor or an indication of human trafficking. Victims can come from a variety of backgrounds and income levels or socioeconomic status. Poverty is often a factor because it causes vulnerability, but it's not a requirement. The third bullet, sex trafficking is the only form of human trafficking. And we, all, we already know that sex and labor trafficking are the two types of human trafficking. And the last bullet on this slide, human trafficking only occurs in illegal underground industries. Human trafficking can and does occur in legitimate businesses as well as underground enterprises. Restaurants, hotels, truck stops, manufacturing plants, on farms, these are all sites that, where human trafficking can occur. Underground markets such as commercial sex in residential brothels and street-based prostitution are also common sites for trafficking. Keep in mind a factoid, 92% of prostitutes are not freelancing. They are being trafficked, and many of them are using a term called survival sex. They're trading sex for food or shelter or drugs. It's very, very common. The last slide on myths and misconceptions. 
If a traffic person consented to be in their initial situation or was misinformed about what type of labor they would be doing or that commercial sex would be involved, then it cannot be human trafficking because they knew better. Initial consent for any reason of a victim as a minor isn't relevant to the crime. This is untrue. And the last bullet on this slide, foreign national trafficking victims are always undocumented immigrants or they're here in this country illegally. Not all foreign national victims are illegal or undocumented. And there's a significant percentage of traffic victims in the United States with legitimate visas or they are, they are U.S. citizens. Now let's talk a little bit about the health effects of human trafficking. There's not a lot of data that is longitudinal about health effects resulted from human trafficking because these individuals are not typically seen over time by healthcare providers because of the fact that they want to keep this issue um, undetected. Most of the studies that have been done focus on the effects of sex trafficking. Cumu cumulative health issues are often seen as a result of overall neglect and lack of health care. Often both physical and mental health issues are present, which is not surprising when you think of the suffering that these people endure. This slide highlights some of the more common, commonly seen mental health problems, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, other stress disorders, anxiety disorders, suicidality, and other somatic disorders, including pain. Other health effects of victims of human trafficking, they really run the gamut and they affect all body systems. Drug and alcohol abuse are frequently seen. Sometimes it's coerced as a means of control of the victim or to increase the profits or it's used as a coping mechanism by the trafficked person as a means of escaping reality. Often victims will have signs of physical abuse or injuries that the person cannot explain. Bruising, burns, cuts or wounds, broken teeth, signs of torture, old or new fractures are often examples. Cardiac and respiratory issues are often seen by working people or people that are working in poor conditions with no regard for the person's safety. Often the traffic victim shows signs of malnourishment and they may be underweight. Obviously, issues related to sexual abuse and repeated sexual contact are often seen by sex traffic victims. Sexually transmitted diseases, particularly um, prevalent in younger, the uh, younger age women. Urinary tract infections, repeated unwanted pregnancies, genital trauma, vaginal anal fistulas, repeated abortion, and the list goes on and on. Exposure can also be observed in traffic persons to extreme temperatures from overheated or underheated areas or from being outside. Labor traffic victims also are at risk for problems resulting from exposure to potential chemicals, toxins, fertilizers, and other environmental hazards. Neurological conditions can also range from headaches, traumatic brain injuries, insomnia to memory loss, and difficulty concentrating. And also, poor dental health is, is frequently observed. Some additional effects. Very limited contact with out, the outside, producing social isolation. Their movements is, are closely controlled and they don't have free access to money, to transportation, to housing, to food, or other necessities of life. Their legal insecurity usually ranges from having their passport, visa, or other ID taken away from them, and they're fearful that authorities may treat them as a criminal instead of a trafficked victim. Developmental issues are often seen in children or minors of those being trafficked since childhood. They may have impaired social skills, delayed physical and cognitive uh, developmental milestones. They may have stunted growth or other consequences of poor nutrition. Here are some red flags for human trafficking. Healthcare professionals can identify with these red flags. So what are they? It's not, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are very commonly seen in individuals who are trafficked. Their victims of trafficking are not free to come and go as they wish. 
They'll have someone who accompanies them if they go to a clinic or an emergency room. Victims of human trafficking are often have um, tattoos or brands on them of some sort. Look for the tattoo, look for barcodes, look for any marks on that person that might indicate ownership. Pay attention to the tattoos that you're seeing repeatedly. Read the tattoos. The tattoos may be an indication of the person that owns that individual and you might be seeing it repeatedly in your area. Also look for marks that might indicate abuse. Burn marks, scars, or bruises. You also might see facial petechiae um, that might indicate strangulation on an individual who comes into your clinic or your hospital. Traffic victims may appear anxious, nervous, tense, or they're maybe even really disoriented, and they're really reluctant to speak for themselves. And this is because they often have someone that accompanies them that wants to act as their interpreter and wants to act on their behalf. You need to be suspicious in these instances. I mean, you want to trust have a trusted interpreter, someone that can interpret the person's language if they're speaking a language other than English, because you want the facts from the person interpreting from the victim. Another red flag is an inconsistency in the person's story. They might not remember accurately, and they might be trying to cover up the truth, and so you may get an inconsistent story if you ask the question in different ways over the time that you're actually interviewing and assessing the patient. Victims who are labor trafficked often have a large debt to pay off and they're paid too little to be able to, to do that. So they're, they are compelled into bondage consistently in order to pay off that debt. Some of the individuals who are trafficked in labor trafficking are told that when they go to a health care system that person's going to have to pay their own way and they don't know how in the world they're going to do that. So um, just keep in mind some of these red flags and some of the resources we'll talk about later about how to address these issues and these victims. The National Human Trafficking Hotline number is 1-888-373-7888. I urge you to have this in your clinic. I urge you to have it available in exam rooms, in bathrooms, and in places where individuals could take down the number if they needed to use it. I've also seen this number written as 1-888-373-7888. So the 888s are on the ends and the 3737 is in the middle. So I've, I've often seen it, it um, depicted that way for ease of remembering the number. However you can get this number out, um, use it yourself as a healthcare professional, and also get it out to the individuals who might need to reach out and get out of their victim um, situation. This is another video that gives you the Michigan perspective. It was done um, by the Macomb, Oakland, and Wayne County Medical Societies. Very well done. We won't have time to review this video today, but I urge you to go later and look at this video to get a perspective about uh, the problem of human trafficking in the state of Michigan. There are many barriers to disclosure for someone who's being trafficked. A question you might have is why wouldn't someone tell a healthcare professional that they're in this situation? The problem is certainly complex and it's very multifaceted. Often the victims of trafficking have been told that healthcare providers and other authority figures should not be trusted. Or the victim is threatened with harm that if they say anything to the provider, they could lose their life or lose a limb or um, be otherwise harmed. They may have been coerced to such a degree that they're emotionally attached to their trafficker. That's all they know. Traffickers have a vested interest in keeping this person dependent on them, and they do everything um, to keep them that way. The victim may be testing the setting to see if it's safe for them to disclose anything. And of course, there may be language barriers and other cultural issues that are present that would cause an individual not to trust the people that they should be trusting. This slide depicts a, a fictitious traffic victim who reports that during the time I was on the street, I went to hospitals, urgent care clinics, women's health clinics, and private doctors. No one ever asked me any time 
anything I ever when, whenever I went to a clinic. According to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center, the healthcare industry is found to come in contact with more human trafficking victims than any other industry. In fact, in 2014, Catherine Kahn, Senior Advisor on Trafficking and Persons for the United States Department of Health and Human Services, testified before Congress that roughly 75 to 88 percent of trafficked women saw a health care provider while in captivity. Most often point of entry was the emergency room, yet very few health care professionals were trained to recognize victims of human trafficking and were unaware of the problem and the individuals got away. So it is very important for healthcare professionals to become familiar with the signs and symptoms of victims who may be trafficked. Some guiding principles of assessment and care. We need to use trauma-informed practice to create a safe and non-judgmental environment for care. Be culturally sensitive in the words that you use and the, the um, nonverbals and the, uh, the body language that you display. Communicate using a collaborative approach, team-based approach. Bring in social workers if you have them. Bring in the physician. Bring in other healthcare professionals, case managers that you have involved in this person's care. Know who has expertise in human trafficking. If you have a SANE nurse, one that's trained or um, certified in sexual assault as a so sexual assault nurse examiner, they're often a great resource in this regard. And develop plans that would include social service providers and case managers and other anti-trafficking um, coalitions and advocates in the care that you provide in your facility. A little more about victim-centered care. Meet the person's basic need. If they have no food, no shelter, they're, they are feeling insecure, you need to address that. You need to re reassure the victim and have in the time that you have allotted in the healthcare encounter you're involved in to build trust with that individual so that they understand that you're there to help them. You're not there to pass judgment. You are there to be a helper to their situation. You need to be conscious of the language that you're using and whether you're creating a power dynamic by, for example, you standing and them sitting or the kinds of language that you might use that would be sensitive to, to a power dynamic. At all costs, what you want to do is avoid re-traumatization or causing more harm to an individual who has already been traumatized. Be very conscious of the tone that you're using. You want to reduce the chances of re-traumatizing the victims. You also want to highlight that person's own resilience and their strengths. And you want to promote healing and recovery, the fact that they can actually recover from this, that you can be a person that would help them recover. And you want to also um, avoid them being re-traumatized by any simple procedures that you might do. Something as simple as a blood draw or, an, or giving IV fluids or anything invasive like a pelvic exam. You need to be very patient and in your communication and patient in the, in the instructions that you will give and the tone and the support that you provide these individuals. You want to be very supportive of the healthy coping mechanisms and behaviors that they might employ to get out of this current situation. Recommendations for, an, for the assessment. Please keep in mind the gender of the provider to do the assessment. This is a very sensitive issue. Women may want to be examined by women. Men may prefer to be examined by men. Professional interpreters, I've already talked a little bit about that. You do not want the person that accompanied the victim to be their interpreter because they are slanting the information, obviously. You also want to provide privacy. If an individual accompanied that, in, that uh, a, a trafficked victim who you suspect to be a trafficked victim to their health care clinic, you will need to get that person out of the exam room. You may have to send them out to register the individual with, with the registration clerk. 
in any event, you need to tell that individual that they must, you must, as a healthcare provider, examine this person alone. And they're not going to like it, but you need to examine this person alone or with, with the interpreter if the person speaks a different language. You need to build rapport as best you can in the time you have allowed and um, be very transparent in the words that you use and the process that you're following and the instructions and information you're providing, the resources you're giving, as well as the, the National Human Trafficking Hotline for them to self-report. Some screening tools for adults. This is a resource from the Genesee County Medical Society, a great resource that was developed in October of 2015. The source is on this slide. These are um, screening, this is a screening tool for adults. Some um, the questions that you might ask them in your screening. Have you ever broken any bones? Had any cuts that required stitches? Any, um, were you ever knocked unconscious? Did anyone ever um, prevent you from leaving a residence or a job or using threats or force to keep you there? Have you ever been, have you ever traded sex for money or drugs or a place to stay or a cell phone or for anything else? And, you know, become familiar with this screening tool for adults. Great information there that you might implement in your clinic. Screening tools for minors. This is a really sensitive evaluation and an assessment, but you need to determine many of the same things in your time with, with the, um, the minor. You need to determine whether there's any history of broken bones or cuts, any use of alcohol, any problems that involve the police, or um, any sexual activity. One of the other hallmarks for minors of trafficking is that of truancy or skipping school often a red flag for individuals who are minors who have, um, have not been at school. They may be prime victims of human trafficking. Some additional interviewing questions that you might, um, that you might use. Evidence of, phys of physical trauma, evidence of sexual trauma, or evidence of drug use might be asked in your questioning. And also from this same resource, the Genesee County Medical Society, evidence of work-related trauma. How many hours a week do you work? Do you ever get time off? Do you actually get paid for the work that you do, etc.? These are other sample questions for people that you might consider are victims of labor trafficking. Here is a glossary of terms um, that's often used in sex trafficking cases language that you may never have heard before or language you might be, you might be familiar with. Um, terms like lot lizard, a person who's been prostituted um, at a truck stop, or a bottom girl or a bottom boy. Um, a bottom girl might be that person that's actually the supervisor or the manager of all the prostituted women for the person that's actually traffic, trafficking them. You may hear some of this language and then become familiar with it. It's another red flag for you. This is a, a smartphone application that was recently developed and researched by Drs. Um, Ray and LeClaire Boknight. It's an algorithm assessment that can be done to determine whether the person in front of you is a victim of either labor, of, of um, sex trafficking. It's not an algorithm for labor trafficking, it's just for sex trafficking that they have um, provided. And you can download this app to your smartphone today. Look for this logo um, in your, uh, on your phone and download it. It is free and it hopefully will help you in clinical situations to identify victims of sex trafficking. Here are other assessment resources. Um, links to other assessment tools that are, were found um, on the web and the literature search done for this presentation. Um, so avail yourself to these resources if you find them to be um, of, of, of your own need. At this time, reporting adults is not a requirement for human trafficking. It's not required unless the situation presents an imminent danger and the person is in, um, is in a life-threatening danger. If you are an employee of Michigan State University, however, 
all university employees um, are required to report. So for any of you out there that are um, employees of Michigan State University, the reporting requirement for adults um, is in place. It's not a national requirement as far as the National Human Trafficking Hotline, but again, if you're an employee of Michigan State University, you are obligated to report. If the person is a minor or you suspect that they are a minor, if they say, yeah, if you ask them how old they are and they tell you 18, or you ask them their date of birth and they are over, they are 18 or over, but you suspect that they are not, um, I would still um, follow your gut and continue to ask questions around the age of the individual if you suspect that they are not yet, um, that they're still a minor. In the state of Michigan, it is mandatory to report minors. First, you need to call the Child Protective Services, the number is on the slide, and that needs that call needs to happen in 24 hours of your um, suspected case. A written report also needs to be submitted within 72 hours. You need to report the person. You must notify this to the head of your organization that um, Child Protective Services has been called and that a report has been submitted. Just reporting suspicions to your organization leaders doesn't satisfy the re legal requirement. You also need to report to CPS um, and the head of your organization might have other policies and procedures to follow. So of course you need to follow those policies and procedures as well. If you do not have a policy in your facility for reporting either adults and minors, I strongly urge you to create one now. The National Human Trafficking Resource Center is a great resource. The link on this, the top of this slide tells you um, what you can expect when you call the hotline. I've called the hotline. You can use the hotline as a healthcare professional and you can also give the number to individuals who you think are victims. On this slide at the bottom you can see where the number is actually uh, the 188 is depicted in not a usual phone number fashion, but it may aid individuals in remembering that hotline number. And I urge you to get involved in your community and use this um, number as you need to. Other ways to be active. What can you do? How can you, how can you advocate for victims of human trafficking? Today's presentation is a way to train healthcare providers, but you can spread the word to healthcare providers that you work with that aren't part of this, this um, offering. You can collaborate with community resources to affect change. You can collaborate with police and fire and other healthcare providers and health systems and behavioral health agencies, and also homeless shelters, for example. You can raise awareness for trafficking for the general public. You can do trainings um, with other peers and outreach and, co and coalitions to just raise awareness of individuals in the general public. You can promote health outreach services by doing screenings. You can do um, rural, in rural health, you can be doing blood pressure screenings. You can be doing screenings of migrant workers. And in many of those situations, you might be you might be detecting individuals who are victims of human trafficking. You can also fund and promote safe places, a safe harbor for trafficked women and children, and improve the outcomes of victims in your own area. The Capital Area Human Trafficking Resource Guide was developed um, in 2016, and a link to the guide is here. If you don't live in the Capital Area region, this doesn't have much impact for you, but there are other resource guides for other regions across the state, and you can develop a resource guide for your own um, area of practice and area in the state of Michigan if one has not yet been developed. You can see the areas of resources that are in this resource guide so that when you identify a victim of human trafficking, you have somewhere for that person to go to get the services that they need. Here is additional help in the state of Michigan. There are human trafficking uh, regional task force across the state of Michigan, and you can see many areas, uh, many of which um, you may reside or work on this slide. So take advantage of this information if it's of help to you. 
One other app that you can download, this is called the Traffic Cam app. Um, and this slide gives you the, the um, information to download it to your smartphone. The developer of this act did so to assist in identifying ho hotel rooms in which victims are posed for online advertising. The, perf the purpose of traffic, traffic Cam is to create a database of hotel room images that an in investigator can use in these efforts. The photographs can then assist as evidence to find and prosecute perpetrators. So, th so there's this national database of photos within hotel rooms so that if a photo is depicted of a victim, the persons who are trying to um, prosecute this crime will know where that individual is that's being hidden there. Some information about personal safety. Never cons confront a a suspected trafficker directly. Don't put yourself in harm um, and be a victim um, that you might put yourself in danger. Always notify local authorities, hospital security, the law enforcement in your area, and contact the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Other ways to take action and other public notification. You can have information and signage in stalls and bathrooms. There can be signage in airports and public transit hubs. Using graphics is a good way to go about it rather than, than words for those individuals that don't speak English or cannot read um, their written word. In the, uh, there can also be graphics on cleaning supplies, similar to several years ago when missing persons were found on milk cartons. There can be information in public parks that are often frequented by nannies, information in schools, grocery stores, hospitals and clinics. There's also a, a move afoot to um, have small hand-sized cards with the hotline instructions on it so individuals can conceal it in their hand. There's also public service announcements on the sides of buses in many um, metropolitan areas that are raising awareness about this problem. For colleagues of yours who might not have been um, part of this presentation today and want to be trained on human trafficking, we have a presentation in the College of Nursing um, at this website that's on this slide to um, introduce healthcare professionals to human trafficking, and it does have um, nursing continuing education contact hours associated. The next few slides are resources and references that were used to develop this, this slides. Some are um, national, some are capital area region, some are um, other resources and sites that found to be helpful in some of the work around, uh, around this issue. Lots of work being done nationally from the, from the um, United States Department of Justice and Homeland Security and Health and Human Services on this problem. I want to leave you with this slide. It's a quote from a TED Talk by Tony Talbot back in 2013 on human trafficking. It's been repeated many times. It's all about the money. Human trafficking is insanely profitable. If you really think about it, you can sell a kilo of heroin once. You can sell a 13-year-old girl 20 times a night, 365 days a year, and you should feel a little outraged about this. You should feel upset about this, and that's great, but it's not enough. Modern-day slavery is right here under our noses. It's a demand and supply business, and it needs to be stopped. I urge you to use the National Human Trafficking Center hotline whenever you need it. And I want to thank you in advance for your attention and attendance today. And I want to thank you in advance for all the victims of human trafficking that you will impact because you are now more aware than before. Thank you. So we'll open. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Somebody is that a sound hold. Um, we'll now open the sites for any questions or comments. So if you have any questions or comments for us, uh, please ask away.
have a question in Kalamazoo, Bronson Methodist. Go ahead. Hi, have you heard of any um, EDs that are developing the, the um, kind of care plans that we've developed for um, frequent flyers of the ED with opioid addiction or that kind of contract, you know, case managed care plan? Doing this, trying to track suspected victims of human trafficking. I, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Have I heard of anyone developing care plans? Yes, if they suspect or just any kind of tracking. Um, any, you know, I just haven't heard of a specialized approach for these clients if you're seeing them more than once in the ED. Well, that I have not heard of specific care plans for these frequent flyer um, drug users, as you've mentioned, but they would be red flagged as victims. So 